So we are kind of along the same lines as we were talking about. Did, did anybody get to hear the message, uh, last Sunday's message online? Get it, if you haven't heard it, you were here. So <laughs> if you've heard it, if you heard it again or whatever, we talked about um, heaven, like in detail. Like we went through what heaven looks like, the New Jerusalem. Um, we talked about what the gates look like. And we went through quite a bit regarding um, the city of God and what it's going to look like and where it's going to come from and how we're going to kind of interact with the city of God and, you know, just in a very real way. You know, we're, because you're, because in, in the, in the um, book of Hebrews, okay, we talked about this. I don't want to look at it because in the book of Hebrews, Abraham is our father of faith. You know, so we have a heavenly father, but we have a father in, of faith, of faith itself, the substance of faith. And it's Abraham. And so, we see in the book of Hebrews that Abraham was told to go to a land that he would be told to go to, which we all know as the promised land, right? This is where Israel came from. But in Hebrews, you see that he actually went farther than that. And he looked beyond the promised land, and he actually saw the city of God. Because it said that Abraham was waiting for the city whose, whose maker is God, whose foundation was laid by God. Well, you know that wasn't the promised land, wasn't foundation made by God. That's the city of God. That's heaven. So his faith was so great <laughs> that when God told him, you're going to go to the promised land, he just kept going. And he went to heaven in his, like, he could see it. And so that's what he was waiting for. And you'll find that through the scripture. Many of our Old Testament, of the Old Testament saints, that's exactly what they saw. They saw the city of God. Well, guess what? We can see the same thing. The city of God. That's where we're headed. That's our, ha that's our home. That's our city. That's our place. Like, where are you from? Fort Myers, Naples? No, I'm, you're from heaven. It's big. We found out it was humongous. 1,500 miles up, down. And then I looked at the moon, and the moon's 2,000 miles in diameter, so I figured it's a little smaller than the moon. It's big. <laughs> it's a big place. And, um, and we, we found out that, you know, there's no stars and sun there because the light is God. And, and that the city gates never close because it's never night. So it's always open. People are always coming in and out. And then we found out what kind of people come in and out of there. Certain people can, are never allowed in there. And certain people come in and out. So we learned all this. So this is all in last. And it was really fun. So we looked at that. And um, we were looking at it from this perspective. We were looking at it from responding to the love of God. Because the love of God brings you all the way to heaven. When you keep responding and hearing, remember how I said, be quiet and listen? You actually hear about the city of God from him. He'll tell you about these things in heaven. There, there are places, and I know it's really, it seems really hard to understand right now because we're so used to this planet. But there's another place. And it's been made by God, and it's an actual city. It's not like some desolate planet like Mars. It's a real place, and we're going to see this place, like with our eyes. We're going to see it. And so we just have to remember that because what, what I was saying before is when it comes to these type of things, we hear them a lot. We hear about the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven, and we think of them almost as if it was a poem. Like, what a beautiful poem that is. And I'm sure that the gates represent this, and the foundation stones represent, oh, and these jewels represent it. And it's almost like a poem, like somebody wrote a story, a poem about heaven. And I don't know what it's going to be like, but guess what? You do know what it's going to be like because it's written about in the Bible. <laughs> and you can read it for yourself. You know, it's like, I don't know what it'll be like in heaven. And I'm like, uh, it says it right here what it's going to be like in heaven. <laughs> so, you know, be encouraged. There's not unknowns about the, there are some, but there's some, a lot of knowns. And it's going to be spectacular. And you don't, you know, some of us may not die. We could, we could actually just see it while we were alive. And some people have gone there. We've read about Paul writing about a man that he knew in the Lord, whether in the body or out of the body, was brought to the third heaven. The third heaven. You got your first heaven, right, which is the sky and the stars and the universe. You got your second heaven. That's where evil spirits live. They're kind of rulers and authorities. They're, they're, yeah, they're dirty. They're yucky. And they kind of rule the place in the earth realm, the, the world system. 
And then you got heaven, which is the third heaven, which is the one we usually think of as heaven. And that's where we're from. That's our citizenship. So it's good. It's good. We've got good stuff, and we've got the Lord showing us what this place is going to be like. So listen to that message, because we had a lot of fun with that. And, um, but we, we kind of got to hear from 1 John. And 1 John 4 is our... It's way up here. Okay, 1 John 4, verse 13. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. Verse 16. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God, in God in him. Verse 17, this is how love is made complete among us, that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. So this is what we were talking about in God has this call, he has this sound that he sent out. And that sound is Jesus. And he is the love of God. And so when we listen, before we knew Jesus, we didn't hear that. And then somebody said to us, Jesus. And we were like, whoa. Because when the person said Jesus, God said Jesus. And we may not have ever had that happen before. Because usually when somebody says something, it's just them saying it. But when God said it, we were like, whoa. And then the minister, or whoever it was, said would you like to know Jesus? And you were like, yes, God, I would. <laughs> because it was the love. And he said, Jesus. And then he said, Jesus, and then our name, our full name, because he knows us. And he said, this is my love for you. And so then in verse 17, it says, this is how the love is made complete, because we'll have confidence. But in verse 16, it says, and we have known and believed the love. So once we believed the love, we said, I believe that. I believe Jesus. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I believe God. I, God, I believe that you sent your Son, Jesus, and that he died for me. And if I was the only person on the entire planet, Jesus would come and just die just for me. If everybody else was perfect and everybody else had their entire life together and I was the only one that was screwed up, I was the only one that didn't do anything right, you would send Jesus just for me. And you would accept him. And when you did that, something happened. Not just like, oh, I feel good about that. But something happened where you went from this person to a new, the Bible talks about a new species of creation. Brand new. That never existed before. And you're of that species. This is the heavenly kingdom of God. This is the citizenship of heaven, and this is the family, his family. Remember, he likes to spend time with his family. He's a family guy. Okay, he's a family God. He's not a guy. <laughs> he's a family God. So we looked at that, and then we went through Abraham, and we went through Noah, and we went through all of these, and then we talked about heaven. And tonight, we're going to talk about something else. Turn to Ephesians 5. In verse 1. In Ephesians 5, verse 1 says this, Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. I like that. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. Children imitate their parents. You know, we imitated our parents. You ever go, like, if you haven't seen your parents in a while and then you hang out with your parents, you're like, wait a minute, that's just like me. Oh, wait, that's just like them. And you're, right? <laughs> Kim knows. <laughs> I hang out with my dad. I sound like my dad. I talk like my dad. I still do anyway, but I talk like him even more. You know, I had uh, one relative, and if she'd hang out with her southern uh, family that she grew up with, all of a sudden she's got a southern accent now. And it's just, you just pick up on it. 
You know, you just get it, and now you're talking with the twang and all, and I'm like, where'd you get that from? Oh, my goodness, and they didn't realize it, but they were hanging out with their southern family, and now their accent all of a sudden changed. But, you know, children and parents, that's a different, you know, this is, this is your parents. And so you imitate them, and sometimes, you know, you're like, oh, my goodness, do I do that? You know, as a parent, <laughs> you're like, what gets you that? Where did I get that from me? And uh, <laughs> I hope not, no. <laughs> uh, but... This is talking about us being imitators of God as dear children. Now, in the Amplified, it says this, Therefore, be imitators of God, copy him, and follow his example, as well-beloved children imitate their father. That's good. So I like that, well-beloved children. And, and um, you can say that about yourself. You say, well, think about all the things I screwed up. Maybe you screwed up when you're a Christian. Maybe you screwed up before you're a Christian. Maybe you screwed up whatever. And you could say, but I'm still well-beloved. Because it didn't say well-behaved. Right? It didn't say imitate your, your, your father, your God, imitate God, your father, as well-behaved children. It said well-beloved children. It's putting the emphasis on him, not us. So he's just saying, look, I'm, I'm taking care of this I heard they said this the other day, I'm remembering it. I'm going to take care of this side of the relationship. That's what God's telling us. I'll take care of this side of the relationship. You won't ever have to worry about this side of the relationship because you're well-beloved. That's good. So, so this brings up the question, if we're to be imitators of God, what's God like? Right? What is he like? Um, if I'm going to copy him, and imitate him, what is he like? And, and the world has answers for that, of what God is like, as weird as that may be. Estranged from God, as the world is, they have their own ideas of what God is like, even though they don't know him. Which tells you a little bit of something about the human spirit. The human spirit is, is absolutely needed this relationship with God. That's the reason why the human spirits, apart from God, make up their own ideas of God. They make up their own concepts of him. As a matter of fact, some places of worship basically say whatever you think of as God is God. So basically that means you don't know God. Because <laughs> if anything you think up of is God, that means you obviously don't know him. Because you can't say that about yourself. Well, anything you think about, you know, Troy, that's Troy. Well, do you know him? <laughs> because it's not the case. He's his own person. <laughs> God's the same way. And, and, you know, I always like to see, like, have you ever watched the movies like, uh, what is it, Percy Jackson and what's some of the others, uh, the Clash of the Titans, maybe if you're back in the 70s and 80s and they had a new, and they have this God, Zeus, you know, he's the top, he's the top guy. Now, this is the Greek mythology, so obviously this was a real mythology at some point, but in America we have our own way of recreating mythology, so we make them in movies. So Zeus, you know, so what is he? He's got lightning bolts, and he's just a pretty cruel guy. Not, he's not very nice. He's got his own family, like, different than all of us, and he just, you know, he's, he's kind in the sense that he didn't just wipe the place out. And so some people think of God like Zeus. You know, he's got a big beard. I mean, think about this for a second. God is timeless. You think he has a big beard? I mean, he doesn't age. I'm just saying. I mean, we don't think about these things, but what does the scripture say he's like? I mean, we have to look at his word. I mean, is he like Buddha? You know, Buddhist, Buddhism is, is, is permeated many Christian religions, and it did this a long time ago. And that's a lot of this um, self-denial business. You know, you, you, you deny yourself all of this stuff because it increases your spirituality. You know, some, some Christians treat fasting this way. You know, you fast, you do all these things, you do all these works, and your, your spirituality increases. You know where that comes from? That's Buddhist. Because you know what the goal of Buddhism is? To be nothing. <laughs> Literally, to be nothing. To be one with nothing. And that's Buddha. That's, his, that's the guy. He just became nothing. You know, you see the guys, one guy, I think they saw one guy and he mummified in the same spot because he became nothing. He had nothing, he became nothing. This is where things like the vow of poverty came from, a vow of poverty. Have you ever read a scripture about a vow of poverty? No such thing. Where'd that come from? It's Buddhist. <laughs> so some people think God is Buddhist, but they don't even realize they think God is Buddhist, but if you study it, you'll realize that's where it came from. And I'm sure there were other religions before Buddha that had the same concept because it's a, it's a demon. And it's the same demon. So he just called it something different. 
Or is he a religious God? You know, the religious God, I don't have a word for him, but they have that one here in America. And a religious God is just very pious. He has a bit of a mean streak. He's a little confusing because you're not sure if it's a good day or a bad day for him, for you. Because if it's a bad day, God, why? If it's a good day, thanks, God. And you're just not sure because he's a confusing God. But he's pious and he's, and it's whatever the will of God is, that's what it, whatever happened today was the will of God. And that's a religious God. You know, that's a God that it's, or, or somebody used to call it the Doris Day Doctrine, okay? K sera sera, whatever will be, will be. Whatever happened today must have been God. We'll just, God will thank you because it just happened. And no, no relationship, no understanding based on the words that he's actually spoken to us, but just kind of this religious God and we honor him as what he is. He's confusing at times. I mean, they won't admit he's confusing, but if you ask them about his behavior, it's confusing behavior. So, <laughs> because you're not sure if he's good or bad. You're not sure. So he's not that. He's not that God. That's not him. We can't imitate that anyway. I mean, what, if you did that, you would probably get in trouble. You would get locked up or something, and you wouldn't have very many friends. Because that religious God, honestly, is not a nice guy. You know, and I'm sure, and I'm not going to say with certainty, but I'm sure that there is a spirit that represents that religious God. Is a, is a religious spirit. And so, and I say that because they're real. I'm not trying to hyper-spiritualize it. That really is what it is. Th those things are real. <laughs> so, God is not our idea about him. He is a real person with a real personality, and he told us what he is like in his book. Pretty simple. He told us what he is like in his book. And it's our letter from him. It isn't a secret letter that somebody found, it's a letter with, if it was a letter in the mail, it would have the thing in the upper left, and it would say God, and it heaven, and then it would have our name on it, and it was handed to us. It's not a mystery, it's not hidden, it's revealed. And how is it revealed? By his spirit. See, this is one of the pieces that miss, that are missing. People will get into the word without the Holy Spirit and they'll wrap that thing around six ways and you won't know what they're talking about. But God's given us his spirit. That's the stamp to deliver the letter. Some people try to read the letter without the stamp. It didn't ever get delivered properly. You didn't read it. So you know what I'm saying? When we get in the word of God, we depend on him to share with us who he is. This, remember, God is a spirit. God is a spirit. He is not, you know, if I wanted to know how this thing was constructed, I could get the instruction manual of how it was constructed. It'll show me all the parts, all the pieces, and I can put it back together. This is natural. God is a spirit. He gave us his word and his spirit. His word and his spirit. And the difference is the spirit. That makes the difference. Anyone can read it, but it's the Spirit of God, and we activate the Spirit of God by our faith. We activate that. So when we hear the Word of God, we allow the Spirit of God to speak those words to us, and now we see. Guess what? He's real, he's here, and he was there. Whatever we're reading, he was there. There are details that only he would know. And he can tell us these things. He's not going to tell us something that is contrary to the other things he's told us. <laughs> right? So we can know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Because he's not going to say one thing and say this other thing. Right? So we can do that. And God's given us that discernment inside to know because there's more than one spirit out there. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Some people can take the Bible, speak it, twist it, and destroy people with it. Who did that? The devil. He tried to do it to Jesus. You think that that doesn't happen still? Of course it does. It happens every week. Every single week. There's somebody out there. There's people out there. And that's why as a minister, you know, me being a minister, we have to be in tune with the Spirit of God. You don't get selfish ambition. You don't get all this stuff mixed in with it. You gotta have, you gotta be right, you know, because Satan certainly would love to come in and twist that thing around. And now you're like, what? You know, and put you on the wrong path. And I'm not saying, yeah, I am. I'm saying be suspicious. <laughs> be suspicious when you hear things and check it against the other scriptures. Check it against the other things you already know. 
Okay, test the spirits, exactly. That's what you're doing, you're testing the spirits. Not every spirit's of God, because it takes the word and the spirit, because we want our Father revealed to us. You know, I've, I've met people and they have taught um, cruelty in, in, in ways and said that it was spiritual. And it wasn't spiritual, it was cruel. And it was mean. It was mean-spirited. It wasn't nice to people. It was being mean to them. And they said, well, no, I mean, this is the next level. I'm like, that's the next level of the flesh, not the next level of the spirit. Because you don't do that stuff. It's not nice. And, you know, people, but see, we talk about Jesus. And Jesus told the one disciple who wanted to follow him, let the dead bury the dead. See, it takes discernment. Some people could look at Jesus and say, Jesus, Jesus you're being cruel. But see, it's the spirit that reveals to us what is truth and what is not. And remember what we said, God is love. Love does no harm to its neighbor, okay? Love builds up other people. What is Jesus doing? Jesus is showing us our own hearts, you know? And so we do need discernment on these things, you know? We don't wanna just throw these things out, but can you ask God? Yeah, is he gonna tell you? Of course he's gonna tell you because he wants you to be led into the truth. And so as you do that, God will reveal these things to you, like he does to all of us. So Ephesians 5, 2. So we want to know, what is he like? So let's just read this scripture. The rest of this, I mean, the whole Bible is filled with what God is like. If you want to look, um, like we did today, Genesis 1. Find out what your father God is like. He speaks things into being. That's faith. He takes invisible substances and turns them into visible substances, with faith. Our Father God does that. Guess what? So can we. So this isn't, I'm not talking about all that tonight. We're just going to go through Ephesians. But that's one thing. But this is what Paul said. He said Ephesians 5 2. Number one, and walk in love as Christ also loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. Number one, walk in love as Christ has loved us. People will say, walk in love, but that's not what it says. Walk in love as Christ has loved us. And what is the, the measure of love? Giving. And what did he give? He gave everything. He gave everything. So this is what he did, but <laughs> see, this is the secret. What do you give that you didn't get back? Jesus gave everything. He's exalted to the right hand of the Father. He's been given the name that is above every name. All authority, all dominion, and all power has been given to Jesus. So you've got to follow that all the way through. These, this is what God did. And guess what God did, got when he gave Jesus? He got us. His church. His body. The body of Christ. He got us. That's powerful. I mean, you know, in, in the scripture, when God made man, we read about how the angels were like, what? What is man? They were amazed that God made man. Because if you look in Genesis, he says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And the angels were like, what? They had not seen that before. I mean, he just made the planet. He just made the light from the dark and the sea. And he made all of the fish of the ocean and all the, the beasts of the field. And then all of a sudden he says, and let us make man in our image. And the angels are like, what is man? Like God. He made us like him. And so we were lost. We were like sheep with no shepherd. And what did he do? He sent the good shepherd. And he gave his life for the sheep. And in him giving his life for the sheep, all the sheep can now come back into the family of God. This pinnacle of creation, man, not in his fallen state, but in his glorified state, is the pinnacle of God's creation here on this planet. And he has given us things powerful things that he wants us to walk in, 
Now, Satan doesn't want us to know about any of this. He does everything in his power to make sure that nobody knows who they are. Everybody has to have amnesia. <laughs> you have to at least think you're a worm or something not worthy. It has to be something like that, right? And he doesn't want us to know because when we know, and I don't mean know like, oh yeah, that's right, but know as in, I'm doing it. I'm moving forward. I'm taking authority. I'm taking ground. I'm taking over what the enemy's taken from me. I'm taking it back. Yeah. He doesn't want anyone to say that. Because once they say that, he loses. Even the little bit he has left, he's lost. So as a church, when God gave Jesus, he got us. Now, we may not think of us like that, but he does. He does. He thinks of us like that. Because we were an R. During the creation, we were the pinnacle. We fell, and now our brother Jesus led the way into this glorious rich inheritance. So walk in love like that. Walk in love, okay, where you can give something that brings spiritual substance back into your life. Right? I can invest in the stock market and I can bring material blessing into my life. I can invest in the spiritual realm and bring back eternal treasure. God does this. He does it all the time. That's what he's given to us. So we can do the same thing. So I say, what is it that I'm doing and what is it bringing back to me in the spiritual realm? Because that's what we can get back from him. So he says for us to love like that. Love like him. And then it says this. That he gave himself as an offering, a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Now, he, he was the sacrifice for us. So we're not going to have to sacrifice ourselves for our sin because Jesus did that. We don't have to. Jesus did some things as our substitute. So we didn't have to do them. So you don't just go do the thing Jesus did because he did that as our substitute. Some things Jesus did, Jesus did as our example. So you have to remember that. When you're looking at the life of Jesus, some things were our substitute, some things were our, for our example so that we would do it like him. Okay, so what did he do? Jesus is God's love, and Jesus is an action word. Okay, when you hear Jesus, that's an action word. <laughs> so when we hear love, we need to see the way that Jesus walked. And he walked only to please the Father. What kind of things did Jesus do? He healed the sick. He cleansed the lepers. He forgave sins. He preached the gospel. He taught. And he cast out demons. All right, it's going to be fun. <laughs> he did this all by love. To follow love, we need to follow Jesus. And Jesus personifies God's love. Turn to Ezekiel 20. 20, 40. And I don't, you know, this is, this is an interesting thing, too, with, with this in verse 2. It says that he gave himself an offering and sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. And have you ever thought about that? Like, things smell. Some things smell in the spiritual realm. They smell. Some things smell really good, and some things don't. Like, you can read in the scripture where, where um, God is like, what you are doing is like smoke in my nostrils. <laughs> He's like, this is really irritating me. So, like, this is in the Old Testament. These were people that did not have a relationship or a covenant with God, okay? But not only did it not smell good, it was actually like smoke, like you were breathing in somebody's campfire. <laughs> so he noticed. <laughs> he noticed that one. It went up a little too far. It can happen. It, it can actually happen. The law of sin and death is still here. Just because we have the spirit of life in Christ Jesus doesn't mean the law of sin and death doesn't still exist. It does. Mm -hmm. And apart from God, that's the thing. That's why we need Jesus, because we don't want things like in America get to the point where we have an America that's got a bonfire in the middle of it and the smoke is going up into God's nostrils. That wouldn't be good. So we need to be light. We need to be salt. We need to take this thing and turn it around, which is what we are doing. But Ezekiel 20, 40, it says this, from on my holy mountain... On the mountain height of Israel, says the Lord God, there all the house of Israel, all of them in the land, shall serve me. There will I graciously accept them 
and there will I require your offerings and the first fruits and the choicest of your contributions with all your sacred things. I will accept you graciously as a pleasant odor when I lead you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries in which you have been scattered. And I will manifest my holiness among you in the sight of the nations who will seek me because of my power displayed in you. And I was talking to somebody um, a little while ago, and they were telling me that they had this time where um, they were going through some very major situations in their business, and like a family business, and their family was getting together and they were praying. And when they began to pray, the Holy Spirit began to manifest in the prayer, and the power of God came on them. And while the presence of God was there in that room, the, the person told me that they started to smell something sweet, and it smelled really good. And they asked another person there, and they said, yeah, I smell it too. <laughs> so this is real. The presence of God, the aroma of God, the aroma that we bring to him. You know, a lot of times I think we think it's just the thing that we do that is pleasing to God, but it is not. It's the thing that we are that's pleasing to God. It's who we are. It's where our heart is in the giving. It's the purity of what we're giving. It doesn't mean we're perfect, but it means it's pure. Its motives are pure. It's a good sacrifice. It's an acceptable sacrifice. Look at Cain and Abel. You had a, an acceptable sacrifice and an unacceptable sacrifice. And the unacceptable guy is like, why is this not acceptable? And he's all mad. And then the guy that was acceptable, he's like, I don't know. I just gave you the best and, the, and you know, fluffy. My lamb, <laughs> you know, and but but it wasn't it wasn't a big show in the natural. It was a simple act of worship that was acceptable to God, and this is what He's looking for. This is how He treats us. You see, He's not asking for something He don't do for us. Now God can put on a show, but He wants us to know His heart, right? God wants us to know His heart. And it, 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 we like to say, like, sometimes you have a conversation, like, I'll just tell you, having a conversation with Kim, and she's talking to me, I'm like, uh-huh, 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 and she's like, and then I'm thinking, what did she just say? <laughs> did I get her heart? No, because I'm just like, uh-huh, 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 right? So I'm not supposed to do that, so I don't do that, right? I don't do that. I listen, and I try not to do that, and I listen so I can hear not just the words, so I hear her heart in it, and I understand, and I'm communicating with her here. Not just, yep, yep, yep. So don't do that with God either. When he's communicating with you, listen to his heart and what he's telling you. Because sometimes he corrects us. And when he corrects us, you really need to hear his heart. Because he, he's trying to get us to the right place. You know? And so sometimes we're like, no, no. All right, I get you. You know, I understand. And then you, and you back down. And you know his heart. What's his heart? His heart is... For you to succeed, for you, because you're the apple of his eye, because you're his well beloved child. And so he wants to get you to that place. So listen here. And so this is the sacrifice. So when we give back to God, he's giving to us from his heart, we give back to him. There's this back and forth. This is worship. This is worship. This is our actions. This isn't like I lift my hands and worship you. This is me every day living as a spirit being, living in the heavenly realm where I just say, well, God, like, and I'll just give you a simple example. I do this. Go walk in the grocery store, walking around. Anything, Lord, anything? What do you want me to do? Just checking, just checking. I'm, I'm supposed to get groceries, of course. Kim sent me to the grocery store. But anything else, you know? I text her anything else from her as well. But, I'm, <laughs> but you can do that. Just being in that constant fellowship with God. Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? It could be for your own benefit. It's always going to be for your own benefit in the end. But maybe, <clears throat> excuse me, maybe there's somebody, maybe there's something. Sometimes he told me, I, I told you guys this story before, sometimes it's like me. It's like, you got the wrong thing. I'm like, oh, I didn't realize I got the wrong thing. It's in my cart. And he's like, because I'm walking along and the Lord's like, stop. And I'm like, okay. He's like, you bought the wrong light bulbs. I'm like, oh. And so, Yep, you're right. I bought the wrong light bulbs. I was not thinking about light bulbs. All I heard was stop. Stop right there. And I stopped. And he said, what? I said, what? And I said, is it those tools? Should I buy those tools? <laughs> I did. I really had this conversation. Of, should I buy those tools? And I'm like, no, that can't be it. <laughs> but I should probably buy those tools. But that's not why. <laughs> that's not why I stopped. 
And, and, then, and then I said, well, what is it? He says, it's the light bulbs. You have the wrong light bulbs. And so I went back and I got, because I got a mixture of the different kind. I got the, um, what was it, the 3,500K and the 5,000K. I, I had them all mixed up. I had a certain one. I wanted the warm light bulbs, and I got the, the, the cold ones and the warm ones together, and it wasn't going to work. So does he care about that? He does. We're his well-beloved children. Is this what Jesus did? Yes. Did he go shopping for light bulbs? No. But he did check in with the Father all the time. He did. Because he said, I don't do anything unless I see my father do it. So what I'm saying is it doesn't have to be hyper-spiritual, like you're, woo, you know, I saw a dragon and he leapt into Lowe's and he ate people and I must, you know, it's like, what? <laughs> that doesn't, now maybe you see that, I have no idea, but sometimes it's real simple, stuff like that. So that's our heavenly father's love for us. And he surprises me all the time with stuff like that. And I'm like, you care about that. I'm like, wow, that is so awesome. He's like, well, why are you asking God about what you should wear? And he said, well, maybe you want to. He's not, listen, if you don't ask him, he won't tell you. Because he's not pushy. But sometimes he'd be like, look, that don't match. <laughs> and you're like, what? <laughs> I always check with Kim. But, <laughs> you know, maybe, uh, maybe you don't have Kim to check with. And you can ask the Lord. He can tell you, you know. It's okay. It's okay. Don't be afraid of people labeling you this, that, and the other. You just love God and let him talk to you, you know? Okay, so the purity of our worship to him is what's sweet. Now look at 1 Timothy 2.8. Here's another scripture with that. First Timothy 2.8. It says, I desire, therefore, that the men pray everywhere. This is women, too. Lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. So I'm, I'm talking, like, about worship to God, okay? So I'm thinking, and I'm seeing this lifting of holy hands, you know, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. See, when our hearts are pure, when we lift our hands up to the Lord in our worship, which is the fruit of our lips, giving praise to God, without wrath, you know, we get mad, we get irritated, we get things, you know, but that's gone without doubting. And it brings a sweet aroma to the Lord. And sometimes we just say, well, I just lifted my hands, they're lifted. They said to lift them, I lifted them, you know, so there you go. I sat down, I stood up, I clapped, I lifted, I did this, I did that. And it's like, that's, who cares about that? <laughs> that's kind of religious, <laughs> you know. I mean, if you're going to lift your hands, just lift them in your house. <laughs> lift them wherever you are, because there you are, and there God is, and you just sense his presence, and maybe you don't. Maybe you just, I just want to tell you how much I love you right now. And I'm going to lift my hands without doubting, without wrath, without any of that. Because you know you get religious. You can get religious. I, listen, I can get religious. It's not good to be religious. I know. I've been religious. You just take your Bible and you just start hitting people with them. That's not in the Bible. You know, and that's the way you can get. And I, I've done that, you know. And, you know, my heart was right in it as far as what I thought it was, which was, yes, that's not in the Bible. <laughs> Don't do that. But... But, you know, you don't have to be in wrath. You don't have to be around and be in, you know, God's, you know, hitman, <laughs> Taking out all the doubt and unbelief in the world. But we can do this without doubt, you know. We can do this without doubt. You can. You can. Some people will say, well, no, you're going to have a doubt. You're going to have, you're going to doubt. You don't have to. If you decide not to doubt, you won't doubt. Right? Say, well, what about that? I mean, I can't walk on water. I doubt I could walk on water. Did God ask you to walk on water? What did he ask you to do? Because you can do that in faith. Because he asked you to do it, you have the word to do it. If he didn't ask you to walk on water, you don't have to worry about having doubt to walk on water. He didn't ask you to walk on water. The only thing you're responsible for is what God told you. He told Peter to come. He didn't tell you to come to him on the water. Now, he might one day. Who knows? And when he does, you'll have faith to do it. Okay, Romans 12, 3 says this. For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly 
and I would say lowly too, but more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one the measure of faith or a measure of faith. So each one of us has the measure of faith. And what they're saying here is use that when you lift your hands to God. Use the measure of faith you have when you lift your hands to God. When you pray, use the faith you have. When you read the Bible, use the faith you have. When you forgive, use the faith you have because you have enough faith. You just have to act on the faith that you have. And the more you act on the faith you have, the stronger your faith becomes. Some teach doubt is acceptable to God, but it's not. Doubt is your cap. Doubt is you capping him. It means you stopped there, and it was based on a decision that you made to doubt instead of to use your faith. So see it like this. Pray with your measure. Read with your measure. Worship with your measure. And don't despise your measure of faith. Don't despise it. It's valuable and precious, and it's all you need. It's all the faith that you need. Jesus said what? If you have faith as a mustard seed, you can do what? You can speak to a mountain, and it would be removed. But there's a difference between the mustard seed in your hand and the speaking, because the speaking is you acting on the mustard seed of faith. So use it. Use the measure. Lift your hands. Say, well, well, I'm going to lift my hands, but when you lift them, lift them in faith. In other words, when you lift your hands, step into the presence of the Lord. Step into his presence. Just be right there, and there are the angels, and there is the throne, and there is the Father God. And you can bow down before him, and you can worship him, and you can be in the presence of the Lord. Why not? Why not do it? You are his child. This is what he wants for us. And then look in this, where it said here in Ezekiel. He said, I will accept you graciously as a pleasant odor when I lead you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries in which you have been scattered, and I will manifest my holiness among you in the sight of the nations. There is a response back from God when our sacrifice is acceptable to him. He said, I will manifest my holiness among you. And this is what we want. We want God to manifest his holiness among us. We want to see the power and the glory of God. Now, what does that mean? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what it's going to look like. But it's going to be good, and it is good. And he's manifesting himself now. He's manifesting himself here. Where we are right now, he's manifesting himself. And that's good. That's good. And we could be thankful before we even know what it was he was manifesting. And so we should do that. Take that measure of faith. What did he say? I'm going to manifest my holiness among you. I think, I think that that is really what we want. I believe that every Christian, of all the things that you want, that's what we want. We want a manifestation of the presence of God. We want a manifestation of the holiness of God and the glory of God, not some religious thing, because religion can go a lot of different ways. You can go old-fashioned religion, normal religion, newfangled religion. There's all sorts of religion, but it doesn't have God in it. It's just me trying to like reach God, but not ma let God manifest to me. But see, you can't do that unless you work that relationship with him and you listen to him, and you decide that it doesn't really matter what people think. I'm not going to do things because of what people think anymore. I'm going to just do it because this is what God told me to do, and I'm going to keep doing it until he tells me to do something different. <laughs> so this is what he wants. And let me take a look real quick here. Let's go back to Ephesians. All right. Ephesians, uh, back to Ephesians again, 5-3. Because that was just the first two verses of Ephesians. I 
supposed to go through the whole book here, but we... Ephesians 5.3, um, I mean the whole chapter. Ephesians 5.3 says this, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you, as is fitting for saints. It says this, this is New Testament. This is New Testament. This is not like, oh, that's Old Testament. No, it's New Testament. Fornication, all uncleanness, covetousness. I mean, that's, these are big pieces here. This stuff happens all the time. You see this all the time. People covet things. They want this. They want that. You know, they want people's stuff. They want people's friends. <laughs> they want all sorts of stuff. Let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. You say, well, it sounds kind of religious to me. It's not religious. Remember what he said at the beginning? He says, as beloved children, as dear children, imitate your father. So why is he saying this here? Because our father don't do any of that. So if we're going to imitate him, we can't be like that. Because it says, don't even let this be named among you. In other words, don't even say, well, that's the guy that's the covetous guy. And that's the guy, you know what I'm saying? Well, because if you look in the scripture, church, you know, churches can get off <laughs> really bad. <laughs> and if you look in like the book of Corinthians, and you can see how bad they got. Because there's one guy, and he was involved in some sin, you know, which was terrible, that they didn't even have in the world going on. And they were proud of it in the church. <laughs> They were like, this guy is really screwed up. And I mean, it was, <laughs> and he's like, this guy, you need to kick him out of the church. You need to kick him out. And you, and you know what else he said? You should give him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his soul is saved at the day of judgment. New Testament. Okay. <laughs> I'm just saying, look, if you, it's hard to, to see this because we're not, not everyone can see all of the manifestations that God's doing right now. Okay, but if we were sitting there next to Paul and he's sitting there and people are giving their offerings and they're saying, I sold this land and here's the money for the offering and this guy, and then up this guy comes and says, I sold this land and here's the money for the offering and Paul looks at him and says, may you perish for the money you gave and the guy drops dead right there on the spot. You'd be like, what? <laughs> and then his wife comes in and she dies right there on the spot. This is New Testament. I'm... Now, I'm not, I'm, okay, I am. I'm warning everybody. This stuff is going to happen because this is the end times and the Holy Spirit is moving and it's going to, and, and it turns up and it's not that God's killing people. It's that the power level is so high that if you, if you tap it, okay, and you're off, you're, I'm not an electrician, but your current is off or whatever, it blows the fuse. And what happened with those two is their fuses got blown <laughs> because their hearts were wrong. So this is why he says, don't let this stuff be named among you. There are places in America right now where they glorify this. And you say, where is it? You pay attention. They do. They're glorifying it. And then they say, well, look, at the world even thinks that we're really cool. And you're like, but wait a minute. We're not supposed to be saying that the world thinks that we're cool. But look at all of the multitudes coming. This must be the Lord. But is it? Is it the Lord? Because did God say, look at the multitudes to know? He said, look at the fruit to know. And I'm not saying there's great big churches in this area, so I'm not saying that. I'm talking about specific things. I'm talking about places. In, I'm not saying local places. I mean places in the country in general, in America, that do glorify these things. There are, there are ministers that have fallen away from the Lord They've become, in, um, they've become what we call universalists. They just believe that anything is, is okay. Any God that you worship, because they were so beat up by the business world of church that they wanted nothing to do with it. But they fell away from the Lord. And so these are things. This is why, but see, let me tell you. <laughs> I'm down. All right. So God is going to clean this up. Okay? It's going to get cleaned up. And... Um, and it, but don't, don't, like, be afraid, okay, in respect, and do the things that are in these scriptures, but don't be afraid in the sense that God's taking everybody out, because it's not that. He has to clean this stuff out. He's coming for a glorious bride. He's coming for a pure and spotless bride, and, and it's not that, it's, like I said, it's the electricity, the power is, is really high, and, and you got to make sure that the current is going to run right through you. 
And if it's not right, it short circuits and you, and, and you go home early. <laughs> so we don't want that, okay? I know it's like, I, listen, I'm just gonna tell you, this is what I just sent to my spirit. So, so we want to not have fornication uncleanness, covetousness, let it not be named among us. Let us keep ourselves pure before the Lord. Let's do what we can do to be pure. That doesn't mean we're going to be perfect. It doesn't mean everything we do is right, but it means our heart is right to the Lord, and we're going to do whatever it takes to keep it right. We're going to do everything it takes to be pure before the Lord because we want his power to manifest. We want his glory to show in our church and in our family and in our lives. We want to see the angels of God ascending and descending from heaven. We want to see the cloud of the glory of God. We want to see the miracles and manifestations of healing and, and signs and wonders where people are like, what is this? That's the presence in the Spirit of God. But our hearts need to be right towards Him. Now, God, will, God is gracious. And we're going to see manifestations of the Spirit of God on areas where you think, how, why would he do that? That's a terrible place, but it's God's grace and love. But us as believers, remember, it's to, this is to believers. Us as believers, let's get in. This is how you get in to the good stuff, is you imitate your father, your father God. You walk like he walked. And so, filthiness, foolish talking, <laughs> coarse jesting, you know, making jokes all the time. <laughs> You know, I make jokes. You know, I have to watch that too. We all do. But see, where do, how far do we want to go? How far do we want to go in it, you know? And I'll, and I'll make a joke, and, and sometimes there's, there's places for jokes, you know? There's places for things like that. But this coarse jesting, you know what it's talking about, right? It's like dirty jokes and things like that, you know? Foolish talking. One of the reasons you don't want to do foolish talking is because you're a speaking spirit. If you do foolish talking, how you, your spirit's getting programmed the wrong way. And when your words go out, they should be creating things. If you're doing foolish talking, your words are being, they're vain. They're vain. I'm just saying. But see, this is, we can grow. We can grow in this. We can grow to understand this. Okay? So no matter, all right, but look, it ends with this. Don't do any of this stuff, but rather giving of thanks. He, God doesn't ever just tell you, don't do all this stuff, and I don't know what you're going to do, but just don't do that. He, he says, don't do this stuff, but do this instead, the giving of thanks. Have you ever noticed that when you give thanks, your attitude changes? Anytime you start complaining, anytime, start thanking God. Just start thanking him. If you can't think of anything to thank him for, thank him that you live in Florida. Thank him that you have a palm tree outside. Thank him that you have whatever it is. There's something you can be thankful for and just keep thanking him. Because that's responding to his love. That's responding to the love of God. Thank you, God. Thank you that there's air conditioning in this room. You know, thank you for, I mean, it's, if you wanted to thank God for all the things you had, you'd be here for days thanking God. I mean, you could thank him for, I mean, the breath that you have, the fact you're on this planet, the fact that you're born of the Spirit, the fact that you're a child of God. You can go through all the many things and then look at all the promises of God. You can thank him for all those things. You say, well, I don't see him. Yeah, you do. They're right there in the Word of God. <laughs> yeah, you see him. Stop saying that. <laughs> you make them happen in your life by speaking them. You want to take it from here and bring it here. It's in this invisible realm. It's an invisible substance. Your words make it a solid. Amen. You know, we know about gas, liquid, and solid, right? So we do know that you can have three sub... Well, this is a spiritual substance, okay? It's what God uses. So giving of thanks, no matter what situation you may find yourself in, you can always find something to be thankful for. Now, the scripture says, in all things, give thanks. And that means in every situation... Be thankful for something. That doesn't mean that every situation that happens to you is God, that you should thank him for it, because it could be the devil. And then you just be like, well, I don't know. But thank God Jesus defeated the devil. <laughs> thank God it's not staying that way. Thank God this situation is changing, because I see it now with the eye of faith and not with the eye of the flesh. So we can always find something to be thankful for. So... This is not an example from God in this scripture um, for our spirit, but it's from the flesh. It's rebellion against God. We're not going to clean up the world, but we can keep ourselves clean from the corruption in the world. The world doesn't need a bath. They need a new creation. 
You can't clean it. It's not going to get clean. As a matter of fact, the Bible's already told us it's actually going to get worse because it's under a curse. Curses keep going until they finish. <laughs> right? They do. They keep going till they finish. It ain't finished yet. It's going to be finished. Oh, and we'll know it's finished <laughs> because there's a lot of things, but we'll know one thing. Satan will be loosed upon the earth. There's going to be some pretty crazy stuff going on. So yeah, it's going to finish, but it's not done yet. There has to be a new creation. That's the only way. It's the only way out. It's the only way out of this place. New creation is the only way. Can't fix it. Doesn't fix. It's broke permanently. The world is going to pass away. What's left here is going up in smoke. <laughs> Woohoo! It's true. It's going to be good, though, because it really doesn't need to stay here. The people, on the other hand, can be saved. And that's our job. Tell them about Jesus, not clean them up, but just tell them about Jesus. Say, hey, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you how much God loves you. That's it. That's all you need to tell them. I mean, it's not, it's not rocket science. <laughs> God, you, he loves you. He sent Jesus for you. This world is passing away. Everything that you see is going to pass away. Everything that you have, everything that you, even if you have a Bentley, a Mercedes, <laughs> a private jet, and a yacht. Big pile of dust. <laughs> That's it. Like I said that one time, just some people's piles of dust are going to be bigger than other people's. <laughs> But it's still a pile of dust. <laughs> so what we want is things that remain. So I have a lot more here to say. I really, really, really hardly got through any of this. But we can know what God has given to us by his spirit and through his word. And we can know what our father is like by the spirit and by the word. And whenever he speaks to our hearts, respond. Always respond. Even if you're not 100% sure what's coming next, just respond. Be like Abraham. Go. Go out to a land that I'm going to tell you about later. But don't just like dip your finger in the lake. Dip your, dip your toe, I mean. Dip your toe in the lake. He said, jump in, you, your family, and everything you have, and go swimming. That's how he tells us to step in faith. It takes faith. You don't just check it out. And so just take that for yourself personally. It's different for everybody. You know, if it's from the Lord, take the step of faith. Don't, don't um, uh, give in to the flesh. Don't give in to the, you know, your mind is always going to say, but what if I don't make it? What if I fail? What if everyone laughs at me? What if this? What if that? What if it blah, 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 blah. Take the faith that you have. Take, and then what I say about a pure heart before the Lord and take that step. And then expect supernatural power, supernatural provision, because that's what Abraham believed for. And supernatural provision isn't just birds delivering food in the desert. Abraham had so much stuff that he intimidated the king of Egypt. That's how much stuff he had. So when we say he provides for you, we're talking about abundant provision. But see, you have to take the step of faith. You have to trust your father. So just remember to trust him. Amen? I have a lot more to say, but I somehow didn't get through any of it. So let's go ahead and close. We'll close in prayer. And uh, Father, we just thank you uh, for your abundant word you've given us tonight. You've really given us quite a bit to digest and to think about, Lord. And uh, we thank you for your abiding presence, that you aren't just here and then gone and here and gone, but you, you've come to abide within us. And any time that we need to come into your presence, we can come in. Help us, show us, reveal to us your presence, that we would see you with the eyes of our spirit and that we would continue to walk in the realms of the glory of the Lord. Thank you for what you're doing. We really look forward to these things that you have said are about to take place on this planet, that we would be right in the middle of your plan and right in the middle of your hand, bringing us to places, people, and times that are set beforehand that we would walk in them, that we would walk in the Spirit. So, Father, we love you tonight. Thank you for everyone here. 
And thank you for a blessed week this week as we go. In Jesus' name, amen.